Welcome to the last talk of this integration track in ApacheCon. We have democratization of integration, making cloud native integration work. Well, that sounds hard. <laughs> um, I think we can start whenever you want. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Maria. Um, hoping you can hear me uh, well enough and, and you can see my screen. Uh, as, as Maria mentioned, yes, the, the title sounds hard uh, because I, I'm guessing the, the space is hard as well. Right? So my talk today, uh, and I'm assuming the last of the day, uh, so of course the best, we save the best for last always, right? Uh, is to talk about the democratization of integration. I'll try and say that in, in one, one sentence. Uh, really making cloud native integration work. Uh, let me just introduce my, myself, introduce myself and, and tell you why I'm talking about this. What's the perspective I'm bringing into this space and uh, we can get started. If you have any questions along the way uh, or towards the end of the session, just add it to uh, the chat window or, or the q and I'm assuming, and we can basically take it from there. All right, so let me switch slides. Uh, so a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a solutions architect by trade. Right? What that means is I've moved away from uh, development. So I came from a development background, uh, came from a product architect background, uh, I, I played a stint as, as a CTO of a, of a product company. Uh, of, uh, I, I was also an entrepreneur. Uh, so basically, I had my own startup. Uh, and, and today, uh, I'm a solutions architect. Uh, and I head a, a team of solutions architects. Uh, solutions architecture, if you're aware of it, uh, I'm, it's known by different names in different organizations and different fields. Right? Some organizations call, call it pre-sales. Uh, some places they're called technical sales, in some places sales engineers. Uh, where I work and in my background, solutions architects are very highly technical engineers with a customer facing background and with a sales uh, skill set as well. So in, in my line of work and my colleagues line of work, we basically talk to a number of leads. Uh, and then of course, some of those leads become customers. But in most product companies, uh, this role is quite critical because it is the solutions architects or the pre-sales who, who really talk to the uh, lead on the other side. The lead on the other side is mostly very, very technical. Uh, and, and, and today there is a lot of information out there. So everyone knows their, their uh, details and their information. So you have to convince uh, that lead that yours is the right solution, right? So basically, I come from that background. Um, so I have dabbled in quite a few open source projects. Uh, I was a board member at the Sahana open source uh, disaster management system, which is kind of like the uh, number one open source uh, disaster management platform globally, uh, deployed in quite a number of countries in national uh, situations. Uh, I was one of the founding members of the project and, and a board member. Uh, and I also dabbled quite a bit in, in uh, GIS and geospatial technology. Uh, I do have a healthcare background as well. Uh, so I'll be pulling some examples from the healthcare integration uh, side of the story too. So, so really why this background is because I'm going to talk from what customers are looking for or what prospects are looking for or what the market is looking for uh, as well. So not just the technology side, but what the requirement is uh, out there. So in terms of the agenda for today, uh, so the case for integration is well known. Uh, we'll just talk about that and why we are talking uh, about the integration topics here. Uh, and, and then, of course, with, with the types of integration today, the types of integration tooling, this is, of course, a very crowded space. Uh, so we'll look into some of the integration challenges uh, and the technology categories uh, that, that build up to those challenges, that contribute to those challenges. Uh, we will look at the different users or in the space uh, they're called as different personas right and different users mean different problems right so we'll, we'll take a look at that uh, we will we'll look at what it means to run integration on the cloud and what it really means from an ownership perspective what does cloud native mean what does cloud mean uh, and what does that mean from a, a ownership uh, perspective 
Similarly, from a governance perspective, what does it mean? Centralization versus decentralization. Then we go into the interesting part, which is what I would call the code chasm, uh, the intersection of various concepts such as low code, uh, no code, which is popping up, full code or pro code. Uh, and is it possible to really have a single solution uh, to cater to all of this? There are different views, but uh, we'll just talk about uh, my experiences. So one of the key things we've seen uh, with organizations in the in the recent past is, of course, that unique digital experiences is what really creates your competitive differentiation. It's your really your competitive differentiation. Uh, I've been working in the space for like more than 20 years now. But interestingly, in the last year, even though uh, there was a pandemic, uh, there was a lot of challenges, economic challenges. But interestingly, there was a lot of innovation in the technology space, in the digital space. A lot of organizations, a lot of brick and mortar organizations started looking at APIs as a means of differentiating uh, and, and trying to go digital. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked in the healthcare space and, and there was a statistic which said that there was around seven to eight years worth of digital transformation carried out in a single year in the healthcare space in the US. Right? And this is quite true in many of the other industries as well. Uh, so most organizations are realizing that unique digital experience is, is, is your competitive differentiation. Uh, and I'll also point to this slide, uh, which is really based on a book by Jeff Lawson of Twilio, uh, where Jeff uh, spoke about uh, build or die, which basically is a variation of the build or buy concept. Many of the customers or prospects who, who come to us or, or I've seen in various forums uh, in the past have looked at commercial off the shelf solutions, right? Where you take a, a solution out of the box, you build a few things on top of that, and, and then you're good to go. Then you got the category of organizations who, who want 100% control of, of everything you do. Uh, so those are the organizations that have large development teams. They have the architects, they have the project managers, they adopt various technologies, uh, they basically start building frameworks on top of those technologies, and then you basically build your, your business value on, on top of that. So you have 100% control, you have, you have absolute uh, decision-making power on how you want to release features, uh, how you want to adapt features, what you really want to build from a framework perspective. And you then have a set of companies who basically uh, go for platforms. You, you basically go for integration platforms, API platforms, and build your business value on top of that. And when you say platform, you cannot use the word loosely because API platforms or integration platforms might be just a small part of the bigger problem, right? The bigger problem that is integration. So build or die was an interesting uh, topic from Jeff Lawson. If you haven't read that book, that's an interesting book. Uh, but it, it talks really about the necessity for organizations to control their own destiny, uh, to look at their own frameworks and not necessarily always build from scratch, right? That's a trade-off, right? But, but basically look at building on top of established platforms that can provide you what you require. And, and of course, we also are aware that every company is a software company building products, right? Regardless of whether you are a bank uh, exp exposing APIs so that uh, you can be like open banking compliant and PSD2 compliant, regardless of whether you are a healthcare insurance company uh, who needs to be compliant with the upcoming CMS regulation and you need to expose fire APIs, or regardless of whether you are a, a transportation industry company where you're trying to digitize uh, the whole infrastructure so that people can look up transportation schedules uh, on their mobile phone. Right? Every company is really becoming a software company and that means every company is building products. Uh, and there's a lot of statistics which say that integration consists of 50 to 60 to sometimes even 70 percent of really building products and the software development process because increasingly today uh, it's software development or building products is about connecting different systems right? you have cloud systems you have on-premises systems you have your back-end systems your mainframes your uh, emrs your ehrs your co-banking systems and really software products are mostly about building to uh, connecting to these different systems converting them from one protocol to the other 
uh, merging different information together and then having a canonical data model that you can export and work with. So integration consists of a major role uh, in software development. So we know that integration is important. Right? There's a lot of information about that. So we know the answer. We know the answer is integration. If, if you are a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan, you would uh, understand the relevance of that image there, 42. Right? So we know the answer. But what's the question? So we see and I see many different types of developers or, or architects or managers coming with different types of integration problems, which all fall under the general umbrella of integration. And when you look at the definition, yes, these are all various types of integrations. But these are all solved in different ways. And not everyone can solve every single problem. As a vendor, you need to figure out exactly what you can solve. As a platform, you need to figure out exactly what you can solve and where it really makes sense to look for a solution. And as a solutions architect, this is your day job. Right? You need to be able to read between the lines, figure out the big picture, and figure out exactly uh, what the, the developer or, or architect is looking for. There's different examples, right? Like, for example, you're an integration specialist. You want to wrap your uh, mainframe code right, and expose uh, APIs on top of the legacy infrastructure so that it, it makes it easier to build applications. If not, you have to go and look for like AS2 programmers. Right? Uh, let's say you're in the healthcare field and, and you need to pull patient information from both Epic and CERN, which are both EMR or EHR systems, and expose a canonical data model. Let's say you are a DBA and, and you want to just maintain consistency across like 10, five to 10 different data sources. You have a master data management problem. So there are different types of integration problem, not just one. So when people say integration, it's sometimes quite broad, right? Because within that, there are problems that you need to really look at. So once you have the challenges, uh, it doesn't help that there are a myriad of technologies out there. Everything which falls under the integration uh, umbrella. Right? Uh, and and there, there are multiple analysts who talk about this, there are different uh, quadrants which which uh, rate like API management uh, vendors, you, you have the EIPaaS and IPaaS vendors. So there's multiple categorizations. But if you if you look at this high level, so you have the full lifecycle API management uh, vendors, uh, basically who, who do API management, you have a variation of that, which is just the API gateways. So if you want to expose your APIs and manage your APIs uh, as an integration, you have the API gateways. API gateways and API management really is a part and parcel of integration today because you need to expose those services in some canonical model in a well-known interface. And that's really APIs. And then it's really the organization's decision to decide whether you expose those integrations or APIs externally or whether you keep those for internal consumption. But in any case, you need to secure those endpoints. You need to manage those endpoints, rate limit them, uh, track who is using them, uh, throttle them, all of that. And that's basically API management. Enterprise service buses have been around for a long time. Uh, we work with customers, like for example, five years ago, who, who wanted to take this big, large uh, center of excellence enterprise service bus and squeeze that in to uh, a container type of model, right? way before Docker came up, just because they wanted to go with the microservices type of uh, approach. right? So, so even in the past, there have been organizations or developers who've been trying to use ESBs in a microservices manner. And today, of course, you have uh, better, more suited solutions for that. But the ESB has been around for a long time. And for some types of integration use cases, the ESB still plays a huge role. And then you can decide whether that's running on the cloud, whether that's running on premises, whether you break that up and split it into pieces. That's really a, a deployment decision. Uh, you then have the integration platform as a service and the enterprise integration platform as a service. The differentiator between that is the latter is a collection of IPaaS technologies, whereas IPaaS would really, by definition, again, uh, in theory, IPaaS would really cater to a single persona, which we'll look at next. The EIPaaS caters to multiple personas and multiple integration problems within the same uh, infrastructure. Right? So basically trying to handle an enterprise use case. You then have 
hybrid integration platforms, uh, which really is a best of both worlds, right? So you, you have your platforms which have a cloud component, but then you also cater to organizations which need some kind of on-premises runtime. Uh, and on-premises can mean on your own data centers or, or on your private clouds that you managed. You then have the, the famous three, uh, which is a, a, a big debate today, right? Which is like low code integration, no code integration and full code integration. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. We have streaming, master data management, managed file transformation, managed file transfers, and then uh, quite recently, the whole RPA uh, track as well, the robotic process automation track. So there are different types of technologies for integration. So when you say integration, again, it doesn't help that you have all these kinds of integrations, but you have to pick the right technology to fit your integration use case. And this is an interesting stat from Gartner, uh, who says through 2024, most of the mid-sized to large organizations, maybe this is a mid-sized to large organization problem, will ha have at least two of those technologies, right? So at least different types of uh, integration categories. In some organizations uh, that I've worked with, I've seen at least uh, three, four, or five different types of integrations. In some cases, people go and do their own thing, which is kind of like a shadow IT model. But then with the small organizations, they might need just simple use cases or, or a standard uh, integration technology, which might be just one, one approach. Right? But it's interesting to know that when you look at medium to large enterprises, most of them will have different types of integration needs. So that brings us to the second problem, which is the number of users. Right? So we know everyone is a developer because every company is a software company. Right? It stands to reason that everyone is a developer. And of course, the definition of a developer can be, can be an engineer. You can basically be a business user who is trying to uh, write some integration to Salesforce. You can be a business user who, who is trying to just pull information from a spreadsheet. So you want to automate it and, and you bring in like RPA into that picture. So in the integration space, uh, according to Gartner and some of the analysts, there are personas who work in the space, right? And we've seen this in our experience. Uh, in the past, I've seen mostly enterprise uh, in enterprise personas who are like integration specialists or specialists in the space who know specific DSLs like uh, Camel or Synapse or, or different types of DSLs, right? Uh, so, and, and you basically are specialists in that space. Uh, today, that also goes into the space where, where you have developers who build integrations using Spring Boot and other technologies as well. Right? But they all are specialists who are trained in specific technologies. Uh, but then you have other types of personas coming up. You have ad hoc uh, integrators who, who come in once in a while. They are not always a specialist integrator, but they know the technology or they know how to do low code integration. So for certain use cases, they would come in and do those integrations. And then you have citizen integrators who are more of a business user who have a different set of uh, use cases. Right? So, oh, yes. Uh, all right. So, uh, so again, basically, if you look at the everyone is a developer concept, there is different concepts. You have the full code, which is a set of specialists in this in, uh, in this inverse pyramid model. So, very low amount of specialists, hard to hire, all of that. Then when you go to low code, a little bit easier to hire because it's mostly visual drag and drop building blocks, low code platforms. Uh, so you, it's it's a bit more easier to get uh, low code engineers compared to uh, full code engineers. And then of course, citizen developers can really be anyone theoretically because you're providing templates, you're providing no code uh, building blocks. So citizen developers can, can basically uh, build their integrations. All right, uh, so if you remember that pyramid as well, uh, another Gartner prediction uh, is the rise of citizen integrators. Uh, and, ag and again, uh, an interesting stat by 2021, at least 50% of large organizations will have citizen integrators. Uh, so another use case is I, I recently was working with, a, with an investment bank, a bank in the US uh, who wanted to expose certain uh, information, certain APIs, to business users of their customers. So if it's a multi-tenanted deployment, you have customer business users who should be able to take those APIs, pull them, do some kind of simple mashup between those APIs, 
and uh, integrate that into their dashboards. Right? So in the past, the way you would do it is you'd basically give those requirements to the platform vendor, and then they would ask the integration developers to build those capabilities and expose it to you. But now you're expecting a self-service model uh, for these integration developers, uh, for these citizen dev developers themselves. Right? So the rise of citizen integration is it's an interesting concept. The other categorization here is on the cloud ownership, who runs what, who owns what, who governs the platform. And, and it's interesting here, and, and we've seen this over the past two, three years. And again, the pandemic has accelerated this quite a bit because everyone was working from home. Uh, you needed a platform or you need infrastructure that you can access centrally, and you needed to continue to do work on it. Right? So uh, having systems that can only be accessed from, from like uh, specific laptops uh, for ma mainframes and so on and so forth was really counterproductive. So we are seeing organizations pivoting to using more cloud services, right? like the sales forces uh, and, and, and the net suites and multiple cloud services. And because of that, integration really now becomes a problem of connecting different cloud systems or connecting cloud to on-premises, or in the case of citizen integrators, connecting cloud and, and uh, various systems to like mobile devices and spreadsheets. Uh, which also means you're shifting your operations cost, uh, your, your DevOps team requirement, your, your management requirements to the cloud, which, which really means uh, you, can, you can look at the total cost of ownership, but in terms of spending time and the risk and so on and so forth, you're moving everything to the cloud, uh, which, which, is a, which is a big benefit that we see with most organizations. But not everyone can move to the cloud on day one, or not everyone can move to the cloud because of compliance requirements, right? Uh, and there might be certain industries, certain governments that have special cases. So in which case, hybrid integration platforms come in, and hybrid platforms can mean many things. Right? You, you can have certain management components running on the cloud, like for example, analytics or observability running on the cloud. But if you want your data and your API is running on premises, then you should be able to do that. So you need the flexibility of being able to run your workloads wherever you want. Uh, this helps many organizations. We've seen this in practice because organizations start with a hybrid model, run their workloads on premises, and then within a year or a couple of years, they are, they are comfortable enough to be able to move some of these workloads to the cloud and go to a full cloud model. So a, a full iPaaS from day one might not work for some companies in some industries, in which case a hybrid platform might be a good option there. We've also seen the differentiation between center of excellence uh, or central governance versus distributed governance or distributed execution. Uh, I was recently working with a, a customer in Australia uh, who had five to six different teams. One team had a majority of citizen developers, one team or two teams had uh, integration personas or integration specialists, and there was another team, majority of ad hoc developers. Right? Uh, Terminology can change, but but basically it was a it was an organization with large teams, uh, and all the teams had different sets of requirements. Uh, so one way that this can be managed uh, is basically by each team picking their own technology. But that's going to be a nightmare when it comes to auditing, uh, procurement, and all of that. Right. So you really need a single team, uh, a single uh, platform, or single set of technologies governed centrally but each of the business units or, or line of businesses need the flexibility to be able to handle integration the way they want to handle integration. So if someone wants to do low code and if another team wants to do uh, like full code or code based development, then they should be able to go into that mode. So you need a platform that can really do that or you need a, a bunch of technologies that can really support multiple use cases. But again, having a common governance model for that uh, either a center of excellence, which is one of the older models, or a central integration strategy, a single team that is uh, that is responsible for the technologies is critical if you really want to scale your integration. Right. So we then come to uh, the code part of this. Uh, and, and there's three, three slides here. So the first one is, can no code platforms solve the integration problem? So what does a no code platform mean? Uh, so a platform that's really built for citizen integrators or business users, where you have templates or recipes 
uh, for like simple repetitive tasks. Like, so if I want to pull information from a spreadsheet, send it to NetSuite, that's a, that's a repetitive task where you can have a template, which I just configure. Uh, these platforms are quite popular. A variation of this is really RPA, Robotic Process Automation. Uh, and for certain use cases, yes, no code platforms perform really well. Uh, there, there are cons, right? It's only applicable for certain use cases. And, and if you cannot, if you haven't predicted that template, uh, then you hit a wall, right? Then you need to use some other technology to write your complex uh, business logic. So then the second one is, can low code platforms solve this? And in most cases, yes. Uh, there are a lot of proponents of low code who say that it's good to remain on low code platforms. Don't drop down into a code level because you, you reduce errors, you, you maximize productivity, you reduce dependency on skilled developers, uh, as in you can still use skilled developers, but the developers spend more time on the difficult things and less time on the simple things because the low code platform abstracts most of it, which is also very true. And we've seen this quite a bit. But then there are some organizations, as I mentioned, who, who like to drop down into a full code model. And what personally we've seen is you can do 60, 70, 80% of the, of the integration work. But then at some point, if you are doing like edge cases, you might hit a wall. Right? Uh, and, and then it's easier to just drop down to code and basically write that integration in like 20 lines as opposed to finding ways of bringing in different building blocks, uh, adding connectors, and, and trying to handle the same situation. So the flexibility of dropping down to code is absolutely essential, or it's quite beneficial. And then you have pro code or full code platforms. Can this be used to solve your integration challenge? I've said yes, but. Yes, it can, but it would take time. Right? So if you're going to write even the simplest use cases with lines of code, it's going to be very effective, very highly performant. You have full control, uh, and you can tie into like coding concepts. But this is going to take time, right? So, so where do you really draw the line? Uh, and and this is what we would call, or what I would call, the uh, code chasm, uh, the the interaction or intersection between low code, no code, and pro code, because really every organization would have different developer personas. All of them work in silos. You want to avoid shadow IT applications with low code, right? And and you basically and the problem is there is no connectivity between like going from no code to low code to full code. Right? You need a way of seamlessly uh, transforming between uh, those uh, systems. Uh, one of the examples I did find and and one of the examples that I'm involved in is is Ballerina, which is an open source cloud native programming language. I put this as a screenshot of what might be a way of br bridging that chasm, where on the left-hand side of your screen, you have code. The right-hand side of your screen, you have uh, a sequence diagram-driven, low-code approach. Uh, and the promise here is that there is full fidelity between both. Uh, so where you can seamlessly transition between low-code and pro-code on the other side. So you edit something on the diagram. You always need that change to happen on the code. And you edit something on the code, always need that change to happen. On, on the diagram, but you can 100% stick to either model as well, which, which might be one way of bridging uh, that chasm. So that brings me to the last uh, couple of slides. How do you select the right platform for integration? So one is you have to consider your use cases carefully. What are you really trying to solve? Second is who are the type of users would be using the platform? If it's specialists, it's a different type of uh, tool that you need to use. But if it's business users, it's a different type of uh, tool or technology you need to use. Uh, and sometimes organizations would have multiple types. But you have to identify that early. You cannot try to solve everything with the same uh, type of tool category. Uh, who will run the system? So that's where cloud comes in or cloud native comes in, right? Do you, do you basically have the skill sets to run this in-house? Do you want to push everything to the cloud and just focus on the business value, right? What's the TCO around that? Uh, do you have in-house capabilities already? Like, do you have an MDM tool? Do you have an ETL tool? If not, uh, if you do, then basically look at the additional gaps that, that you have. And what other problems are you trying to solve? That's critical because sometimes organizations look at solving their API problem, their integration problem, but then you still have to tie that into your version control, tie it into your 
uh, code repository, uh, handle your debugging and testing and observability and, and analytics. So you need a platform that can really tie everything together. Uh, and and we, we've seen architectures that do this. Like, for example, if you use Apache Camel or Apache Synapse or some integration frameworks, you can build fully cloud native integration platforms uh, in a microservices manner, right? Where you have micro gateways, you have your services, you have your integration within those pods itself. And then your gateway is used to expose APIs uh, from a single pod and you handle all of your integrations within that. But if you look at a bigger picture, uh, and, and if, you, if you go into details here, this is a, a re reference architecture diagram that looks at how you can integrate various technologies where you have low-code platform, low-code platforms, no-code platforms, uh, but then tie that into the other challenges that you're trying to solve. You're trying to expose APIs in a marketplace. You're trying to tie this into your build pipeline where you want to build, test, run, and deploy, and you are trying to tie this into your design pipeline where your solutions architects design uh, the, the artifacts, right? So, so a platform that can do everything is beneficial uh, and you can pull together these various technologies. Uh, that is an important aspect. So is there a concept of one tool to rule them all? Is there a one size fits all solution? Some would say yes, some would say no. Uh, both are correct depending on the situation and the context, right? So a tool would really need support for various integration personas. That's key because citizen integrators are really here to say, uh, regardless of what type of integration people do, there are different uh, personas. You do need node code template support uh, with, and, and you need the ability for developers to create their own templates, right? Because if not, you're relying on the vendor to create uh, all of the node code templates. You need the transition between all of these personas and all of these uh, technologies. Right? going from code to pro code, 100% uh, fidelity between code and visual. Uh, fidelity and seamless transition from a service concept to what an integration is, to what an API is, to what an application is, is also critical because at the end of the day, you are trying to expose your backend systems and you're trying to build some kind of application to consume APIs. Right? So that's your business use case. So you need that seamless transition between all of those. And then security is a big part of that ecosystem. Uh, and then, of course, tying into coding best practices, supporting your cloud native uh, concepts, so on and so forth. Uh, so since we're ending uh, nearing the end of this session, I'll just summarize. Uh, not all integration challenges are the same. That's the critical uh, part of, of this session. If someone comes saying, OK, I need an integration platform, there are multiple types of integration which fall under the same umbrella. Uh, and, and of course, we, what that means is the people trying to do integration can have different skill sets. There are, there are different personas, there's different types of requirements, there's different time requirements, uh, and all of that contributes to the integration challenge. There is a continuous expansion of integration tools, right? So you have IPaaS, you have EIPaaS, you have AI-assisted integration technologies, uh, you have robotic process automation, you have multiple ways of handling these integration challenges and handling different niche areas of integration. Uh, but as we also saw, most of the medium to large organizations would have multiple uh, of these challenges, and then they need a solution that can handle uh, at least more than two. So find, finding a best fit solution is challenging. If there is a one size fit all platform, so is it a one size fit all, fit all or is it a collection of technologies? That's where a central integration strategy is important and a central integration team uh, ownership is important who can look at the bigger picture of the organization and have enough flexibility uh, to handle the different use cases. But there is, of course, room for innovation in this, in this field as well. There's still some gaps, uh, and I think we can see a lot of evolutions in the coming months and the coming years in the integration space. So that's basically it. I think I'm right on time or just over time. Uh, if there are any questions, I think I can take that. Uh, if not, it's the end of the day as well, at least for me. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, now we have the, the Birds of a Feather session. So maybe someone wants to join and continue talking to you. I don't see any question, but I, I want to say that I agree a lot with you. and. Um, I think 
we are going to see more um, different platforms to do integrations. I mean, we have things like Zapier that is for people that completely mm -hmm. no code or yes. well not. Com and we have things like Apache Camel. Hey, Camel, mm -hmm. hi. Yes. <laughs> And there is a whole range of things in between, and I, I think to summarize it very clearly. Oh, we have a question. Any suggestion on how to convince business owners of this strategy? Hmm. Yes. So, so I think business owner, like some time back, uh, there was this whole trend of convincing business owners that APIs are, are the key to business, right? So, an API strategy is very important. Integration often lies below the surface because integration is not, not as hot as API management. Right? But integration and API management go hand in hand. So if you are convincing a business owner, you, you need to go in and, and look at the multiple systems. You need to look at the personas. Uh, you, you need to basically be able to convince the, the, the businesses that APIs and integration are part and parcel of the same problem. And then having those integrations done really well and having those APIs exposed correctly is a key part of any digital business. Like, and regardless of whether you're going to build a mobile application, whether you're going to roll out uh, something uh, to, to handle the pandemic, or whether you're going to comply with one of the regulations, you, you need those integrations and, and APIs as a core competency within the organization. Right? So it, it is a tough role, but then that's the role of enterprise architects and, and that's where they need to step in and uh, explain. <laughs> uh, so long since I saw Matrix background, there is a reboot actually coming out, I think, this year or next year, right? I just saw the trailer, which is pretty exciting. So, <laughs> I prefer not to think about that. They... <laughs> when yes. they take old films and try to do new things. Yes, it's a sensitive area. Yes. <laughs> So Thanks. thank you so much. I, I really like this presentation. This is this is really good. And it's something even if um, people sometimes come to the Apache Con to hear hard technical stuff, this is something we also have to discuss. The, the general view and the general overview and the strategy of everything. So thank you so much for these presentations. Will the slides be available somewhere? Uh, um, yes, yes, I'll, I'll put it up. I, uh, I'm not sure whether Apache will be putting it up as well, but then uh, I'll be putting it up on, on SlideShare and uh, make it available. Uh, I had to figure out exactly how to communicate that, but uh, yeah. Well, this is being reported. So I guess in a few weeks, months, I don't know how long it will be published. Okay. If I don't know if there's any more questions. If not, see you on the um, Pierce of a Feather, which I think is another different session here. Thanks. And Thanks. Thank yeah. you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Maria. Bye.